this is a tape and slideshow describing information relating to Courtauld's factory in Nuneaton. The construction of the building commenced in 1920 and it was demolished in 1995. The slides being shown were taken by Les Holmes in 1995. Joan Beresford worked there for 44 years and will now describe and relate some of her experiences. The first slide is a panoramic view. What do you see there, Joan? Well, the thing that stands out most really is the clock itself. Um, everybody used to look for the clock when they came into Nuneet and they knew it was home. You could see it from Trent Valley, you could see it from Abbey Street Station as you came in and as soon as you saw the clock you knew it was home. Um, well I, I lived in Cheverell Street as you did and we used to tell our time by it didn't we? We had, we used to, well I lived in the middle of Chevrolet Street so to check our clocks I always used to have to run to the end of the street and see what the time was and then run back and tell, tell my mother and father and they used to adjust the clocks according to what I said. Yeah, I had the same experience, I used to run down the garden to look at the time then we'd hear it chiming. It, it was the same when I went to school at Swinnerton. Yeah. I always used to look at the clock and if it wasn't what it, what time it should be, you know, I used to run like mad down the street. Yeah. Well, this slide shows the coal in the foreground. The coal used to come along the canal, didn't it? Coal came along the canal in barges, to begin with any road, and then um, as time went on the canal was no longer used and they used to bring it in by lorry. But um, the coal is in front of what used to be um, the great big engine room where they um, had the boilers and that and it used to heat up all the factory. Yeah, I suppose as well as the people working in the factory there must have been quite a few working, you know, dealing with receiving the coal and all that sort of thing. Yes, the, there was. Um, the, the coal part coming in by canal was finished years before I, you know, I started there. Um, it, I used to see it come in through the gates and over the weighing machine that was at the gatehouse. Um, but you, you, you had got people who were in charge of all these different departments um, and you know there was people that all got their own special jobs which co contributed to making it a well-run mill. Yeah, well, this is a fine view of the building isn't it really, it um, does well, really stand out over Nuneet and I think it's a great loss that it's gone don't you? Yes it is. Mm. This is here is the back part of the twisting and then you used to have um, the bicycle sheds where people used to leave the bicycles and uh, then there was the yard that run down by the side of the mill there mm. now this this shows it um when it's no longer used, doesn't it? So the, mm. so the windows are broken, some of them. Yeah. How, how many people work there altogether, do you reckon? Um, At its peak? Well, I, I was told it is at its peak that it had got thousand thousand eight hundred that used to work there but you've got to remember the sheds spread right to the back as well as having shifts as well yeah, yeah. Um, they had a two shift system running and um, 
then you've got the twisting sheds and the warping sheds which the warping sheds during the war were converted uh, to wrist and cables for war work. Oh I see. What actually did you make at Courtauld's? Well I was on the warping. Um, it was the biggest processing mill in the whole of Europe was um, Courtauld's at Nuneaton. It actually made, did the spooling, um, spooling of the weft, um, it did winding, it did cheesing, it did coning, and it actually did um, warping, that is making the warp for the beginning part of weaving, that's the threads that go down, uh -huh. and the spooling is the thread that actually goes across and they went on to long tubes that went into um, this, the shuttles on the weaving machines and it wove through the thread. But the warping, um, they used to do section warping and you could have anything from uh, 10 sections up to 30 sections to make a warp. Each section consisted of 500 ends so depending on how many ends they wanted in the warp that depended on how many sections that you had in it. Um, then there was another part of it where they sized it that was kind of starched it, stiffened it so that um, it would all lie in place ready to go into the weaving machines. Mm -hmm. um, that eventually is washed out of the material once it was woven. They also um, in later years brought in what they called the slashing and that was to make bigger, uh, bigger warp still. Um, they ran up to about 20,000 to 30,000 ends and what happened is they used to make what they call beams um, and they used to run off great big frames the ends had and they used to have to, um, up to uh, 500, just over 500 ends and they were all running at once, came down onto these beams went over rollers and then came down onto the beams and then depending on how many ends you wanted on your slashed warp they then used to do anything from four up to twelve sixteen beams and they were dropped into a great big frame and all these ends were pulled over and down into reeds, threaded into reeds and then it was run over more rollers and slashed into a bigger warp still. But they were, they could be unsized warps or just have a little bit of sizing at the beginning and the end just depending on what the customer asked for. I see. That sounds quite complicated but um, it certainly found a lot of work for local people. Did a lot of them live sort of near the factory? Not, well, they did to begin with because some of the houses um, in Clement Street used to actually belong to Court Did they really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they came from as far as Arley and as far as Bedworth and Fosil, mostly that that side. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, this is another fine view of, of the building. Um, it's a matter of memory now, isn't it? Well, you can't actually see it there, but if you start on the ground floor of the building, that was where they used to store all the cheeses and all the weft that was going out um, to the customers and they actually used to load just inside the yard the lorries would come in and they would load just inside the yard there and there was a loading dock 
then on to the next floor on the next floor half of it um, became it wasn't always that but when I started working there half of it was the offices and the other half of it was where they stored all their containers their boxes and that to put that they could be built up um, ready to go into the different departments to put the boxes in and every, to put the cheeses in the next floor up above that which is the second floor um, that was where they did all their coning um, and then in later years that was converted when they did away with the coning it was converted into a twisting shop where they twisted all the cheeses to send out to customers on the next floor that was where they did all their spooling but as they got more custom come in and more customers wanted twisted cheeses they again converted that floor into twisting and the very top floor was the floor where they did all their training um, this side that you can see by the clock that that side of it um, was the twisting and also the warping and the coning they did all the training up there and most girls had to go up there for anything from a fortnight up to six weeks to learn how to do the particular job that they wanted to do behind it as well was some more storage space that they had well that's another very clear slide isn't it mm. this that's in the front of the slide here is the surgery um, the part that's closest to the um, the corner there where the tree is that was the main part of the surgery and um, next to that was um, where the sister used to be and also there were offices for the works doctor to come in and visit they also had in their um, small kind of wards where people could actually come in and lie down if they didn't feel like working, uh, if they were ill. <laughs> well, conditions good to work in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that... at this end here, they had um, baths as well, where people could actually... Uh, Lots of people that lived in the houses round about the workers and that didn't have their own baths. So they could actually book in there and have a weekly bath in there. Well, that would be very useful. But it, it was also useful in case they had any accidents with the size, you know, um, size tipped over anybody or chemicals. They could actually come in and have it all washed off in there. That they had their own staff people there all the time? They had their own sister and two nurses. They had a works doctor that came in um, once, once a month, unless he was asked to come in for anything else special. They had a shropodist that came in once a month because they thought it was good for workers to, as they stood on their feet all day long, to have... Um, good feet they have it um, and they they would treat any complaints that they had of the feet uh, and you paid a small charge on that it wasn't very much um, that's very interesting um, it's nice when you think they did look after you I mean it's in their interest though to keep you working <laughs> it wasn't was it? in their interest yeah. to keep you working what about this view This view is the back part of the mill. When they changed over, you can't, it's not really far enough along. When they, on the second floor, a bit further along, 
um, the window has actually been taken out and there was some hoist put there so that they actually lifted all the machinery um, up into the mill when they put the twisting machines in and also they took out um, they took out the coning machines that way as well you couldn't have took it up by a lift because the machines were too heavy and you couldn't have gone up the stairs because they were all winding stairs anyway so that was the only way that they could take the machines out the old machines out and put the new ones in well that, that's Marlborough Road isn't it? that's Canteen yeah <laughs> that, that, it, it was a good canteen, it really was, you could get a good meal there and it was quite cheap. Um, so if you didn't have a lot of money I suppose you could be sure for um, a matter of about two shillings, two and six, you, you, you could get a good three course meal in there or you, you need go in for a full meal. Um, you could just have what you want and took your tray along and you, you had what you want but the bottom part here was for the ordinary workers and then at the back there's another piece that stands back and that was where the staff used to go and get their dinners the same sort of dinners but you had this thing that was the staff canteen and this was for the ordinary workers and uh, you didn't really go into the staff canteen, you know, in those days they did kind of keep them separate. They kept the staff separate from the work people in the factory? Yeah, very, very yeah. much so. Yeah. What about the managers? Did they have theirs? With the them? managers went in, they had another room in the staff quarters. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they just mixed with the managers. So there was a little bit of sort of class distinction, if um, you put it that way. Yeah, very much so for quite a number of years. Be um, the people that worked uh, in the offices upstairs were not supposed to talk uh, even to those that worked in the smaller offices down on the shop floor. Um, I don't know why it was just a bit of class distinction I suppose those that had staff jobs they were thought to be that little better a little bit better than those that worked on the machine. Yes machines. but uh, I suppose in some cases some of the staff would probably get paid less than the factory works if they were on production of some sort would they get paid on what they did in, sort of thing in some cases in those days um, it was a benefit okay you didn't get a great deal of money Cortos has never been known for paying great wages big wages but they've been known for paying a regular steady wage and that's why a lot of people used to like to go and work there but with the staff they used to get a lot of little perks which the others hadn't used to get on the shop floor. I see. Now in that canteen they used to hold dances didn't they? The dances were held on the top floor and it was a beautiful maple floor. Oh well, was it? Mm. It, it really was um, very highly polished. And I think they'd hire it out wouldn't they? They, they did hire it. I've been to functions there. They did hire it out and um, it was a beautiful dance floor. So I mean, apart from and the it got a lovely spring in it as yeah. well. Apart from the factory closing, that's a loss to the uh, environment, isn't it? Not having any, yeah. you know, not having mm. the uh, place mm. to go for the dances and receptions, etc. Well, yeah, because it, it's now become a factory. I'm not sure what happened to that floor up there. But no. Um, Well, that's a side view, isn't it? Um, that's a side shows, view. Um, it was certainly well built, wasn't it? It was well built and the windows were big windows to let in enough light for the 
work is to um, see the yarn on the machines and how they had to thread them down. Was the lighting pretty good for the work, you know, to see what you were doing in the Fair... Because it could be a strain on the eyes, I suppose. It could, it could be a strain on the eyes. Um, yes, they, 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 yes, it was very good lighting, lighting, and they also added to it by putting all this strip lighting above all the machines. Um, the only drawback, really, was for when they put the offices up there. If you had a desk by one of those windows, it could be very cold and they used to have to, during the winter, drop big plastic curtains down by the windows to keep the draft out. So you actually worked in the office, did you, in a lot of your time? No, no. You I, I started on a warping machine and I was on a warping machine for, I uh, started at 15 and a half. Um, and when I got to my twenties, they were thinking of reorganising the way they did stock control. It was just something that had been tried out. Apparently, they used to lose an awful lot of stock and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So they decided that each department should have its own stock controller. Well, at 21, they asked me if I would like the job but it was only a trial for the first 12 months. Um, but they gave me the job of looking after the yarn that came into the warping department and went out of the warping department and I had to control the stock books. Also I had to make sure there was enough yarn there for the warping machines to complete their orders and it was up to me to uh, phone around the different departments in the factory to find out where it was if I if I hadn't got enough. I also um, used to be liaison with the um, laboratory manager, Mr. Booth, and if because when you had yarn it was all coded as to the day it was produced, the week it was produced, the month it was produced. So if you had yarn coming in that was different to what you've been using, you have to take three of the cheeses of the old yarn and three of the cheeses of the new yarn up to the laboratory and they would do what they called carded it. And that was to put them, wind them onto a, a cardboard card um, and they had the six different ends and you could see whether they would actually blend together or if one lot stood out, the shade of one lot stood out from another. And um, if there was any difference, when the manager came and the laboratory manager came and had a look at it, he would say to me, well, yes, you can mix it or no, you can't mix it. Or yes, you can mix it if you use it in such in a certain way. And he used to write down on a piece of paper how I got to have these cheeses put on to the machine. It could be a row at a time, or it could be two rows at a time, so that it the shading was lost as it went on to the big drum for the warping. Um, and I'd have to go back to the girl on the machine and tell her that this is how we wanted it done. So the girl, along with the creelers, would then start to put all these cheeses in the different way that I told them onto uh, the big creel that they got there. What, was it mainly ladies that worked there? Um, no, he, it was on the machines, yes. in the warping. Mm -hmm. Um, you used to have the men who'd set the beams and take the beams out and move them down into the sizing department. I used to have men that took the yarn to the machines for me. Um, it was men that would also bring um, the yarn in from the different departments, the coning and the twisting. And I would tell them where I wanted it stacked. But I went 
from I went from the warp in any road up to um, up into the main office then and I still stopped on stock control and I was on stock control and this time it was yarn not only going into the factory but yarn going out of the mm -hmm. factory to the different customers and then as time went on I actually got the um, the warps and that and the back beams um, I was in control of that getting that out to the customer and then as later years came um, I went on to computers with it computerized yeah. no, I, I did kick against the computers mm. <laughs> but it was what was coming in and we had to accept it that's right uh, this slide here shows a date 1920 when the building was I understand first commenced um, what do you know about this area well that l actually led into um, where they used to store the cheeses on the ground floor. Um, it wasn't that one, it was the next one. That one, for some unknown, well unknown to me any road, was actually closed. We never, I've, I'd never used that one. But the one that was a bit further down is the one that um, was still used for quite some time for the office workers to go in and out or for um, visitors who come to see the manager and that they came in that other door and then were taken up the main the main stairs is this the part of the building that's still there now that's the part that's incorporated um, into the new flats isn't it I see And that's the other entrance that's, you were talking about. That's the other about. entrance that I was talking about, the yeah. one in which um, the reps and all that used to come in through that door. And almost, although the, they'd got yarn stacked there, there was um, a pathway marked out on the floor and it led them almost to um, the steps that went up to the, up to the mill up into the second floor of the mill. And this is the new buildings that was built. These were built afterwards? Yeah. Um, they were they were going to um, finish with all that process that they got there. They finished with the twisting process because there was no call for it. Well, there was a call for it, but they moved it on to Spondon and they moved it out to Little Heath. Um, the twisting and the coning uh, and the winding was all moved out to these other places. And it just came down that they did um, the dressing of the warps. That was any warps that were damaged and the customer sent them back the dressing of the warps, sizing was still there for a time but even that went eventually uh, and it was just all slashing and then they brought in when they started to do knit beams and that came in where there was a lot of knitted fabrics um, they brought that in so now at the moment what they do is slashed warps, they're still doing a lot of slash warps and they do quite a lot of um, this knitting, these knit beams. Um, the knit beams themselves now are onto computer. Well, that's a very interesting slide, isn't it? Showing the, uh, it's almost ghostly, isn't it, in a way? I suppose there's, there's some ghosts of former workers knocking about in there somewhere. I'm sure there must be. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the old workers are very sad to see that go. There must be quite a few of them still living round about. Yeah. The, the amusing thing was when they knew that they were going to um, 
they were going to, well, at least close the mill down. They did all sorts of things to try and think of what to do with the mill. And um, they used to um, think that probably the top floor of it could be converted into a greenhouse where they could grow tomatoes oh dear. and all that sort of thing and sell it and then they got other parts of the mill they were going to use for a museum then they they thought well perhaps it could be turned into a, a kind of gymnasium where they had um, on different floors uh, different sorts of exercises and all that going they they were they were really i suppose amusing ideas when you think back on it now but they were so desperate to keep the mill open not to let it be destroyed you're talking now about the management are you and the people oh, work, the, these were the people in the offices yeah it's a pity that in this day and age something couldn't have been done rather than just replace mm. it with housing well what bit by bit um, they were actually going to close the mill itself and everything down and bit by bit we'd sat there for almost two years watching each section being closed down and moved out um, to the other parts of Courtos at Spondon and Little Eath um, at Lancaster um, in fact it was Lancaster where they were going to move the warp into um, and we were having to transfer everything think out even the um, even the orders went as well and then right and it, it got down to there was only about eight staff left they got rid of everybody in in the mill were you, were you or yeah. as one of the last people yeah, to we were, leave. Yeah, we were there because we said we would stay um, just to tidy up the ends. And at the last people went out of the mill from the from the back beaming at um, two o'clock when the shift finished. And the electricians then had started to... Um, take the machines down, uh, dismantle them and then at four o'clock it was, there was a phone call came through and they got um, an order for a broad that had got to be done and Lancaster couldn't get it out on time, could we do it for them and it had to be got out within the month. Um, and they said, well, all the workers are gone, so this is, well, get them back again. So they got a couple of the machines wired back up and ready for running. Um, they had to leave a space of time because these people had been ma made redundant. But they sent out letters asking them if they were, wanted to come back in again. And they came back in to do this order. But when they... Um, firms in Europe, the weaving firms in Europe, heard that the Neaton Mill was opened up. They actually said that they wanted, because they were so uh, dissatisfied with the warps that they'd been having from Lancaster, they actually said that if we can't have our warps from the Neaton, then we will transfer somewhere else. And so eventually they had to keep bringing back more and more workers and building up more and more machines and that's how it actually got going again. And it is quite a going concern now. And these these slides now show the, act, the building gradually sort of being demolished, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> that's sad when you, you think during the war the Germans came along the canal bombing and they dropped bombs on the end of the, the mill but that all got rebuilt up. If you think about it, we, we've torn down something that the Germans couldn't destroy That's with their right. bombing. Yeah. So, just laughable. It is. Mm. But 
I had, um, well, Mr. Burtonshaw that worked opposite, that lives opposite, was talking to some of the workers and they were saying how difficult it was to um, pull the mill down because it was so well built and it took them far longer to pull the mill down than they thought it would do because the way it was actually built. This slide shows machines similar to what you machines used to Machines similar to what used to be in the twisting department. Mm. Um, they, they had belts, belts on that came round, went the whole length of the machine and drove the machine. Um, and you could adjust the speeds of the machine depending on how much twist that you wanted put into the thread. You, you could start at having just five turns put in the thread or and then it could go up to anything like 40, 40 turns in the thread and also in the thicknesses you had different filaments as well. Now th this is a picture with the um, Courtauld's clock in the background, that's a sort of picture we saw as children isn't it from different parts of Nuneaton well up, up till the time of it being demolished but up to this um, it was it was a landmark and it yeah. was something that everybody looked for yeah um, when they actually came into Nuneaton it was the first thing you always looked for and one of the ladies that used to work in the um, in the warping department, I was speaking to her not so long ago and she lives in a house that's quite nearby and she says one of the things she misses is the striking of the clock. Yes, and it was looked after wasn't it by a, a, a local chap for years, even uh, latterly after the, after the factory was closed. Oh yeah. yeah, well he was the one that looked after it. Oh, for many years. All the time that I worked there, he used to come every so often to check it over, uh, check all the works over inside. Mm. Well, I believe to keep although, it in time. Although the, the clock's gone from the neat, it, it's still been preserved, I understand, somewhere, isn't it? Uh, it's been preserved at Lincoln in a museum there. It's a clock museum. Mm. Now these are allotments, um, uh, they're not there now are they? Well they're the allotments on the other side of the canal. Yeah, Greenmore Road side. Greenmore Road yeah. side. But behind the mill, during the war they used to have shelters uh, and by the shelters the, there was a piece of land there at the back of the mill behind the warping department which was also allotments and um, they used to be let out to the workers, they used to rent them and grow all sorts of vegetables and that on. And now we get another view of the canal barges visible. It really was a landmark wasn't it? It, w it was a landmark. The other landmark which is not on these I suppose you haven't used to notice it so much was the tall chimney. They had a very, very tall chimney which is attached to the steam house where they produced um, all the hot water and all the steam for the factory and for the sizing machines. Because mm. the cylinders um, were all heated with steam which actually came in from the big powerhouse at the back there. I suppose when they originally planned it and built it they probably put it by the canal deliberately because that would be useful to it in some way. 
Well, it, it was useful for bringing in the, the coal, wasn't it, when it came from mm. Bermuda in that way? Because it came, uh, a lot of the pits are actually close by to the, the canals, weren't they? That's right. I know those in Bermuda were. They loaded the barges um, in a little cut-off that was just the other side of Bermuda. And then it would be brought down the canal and unloaded at the back of the factory straight onto the, um, the big store place by the, the steam place by, by the powerhouse. Now can you tell me where this is? Well this is, this is um, Abbey, Abbey Street. Uh, if you go around the corner you've got St John's Church. Well that's right, yes. And you're facing the co-op car park. Oh this is um, a new road really, isn't it, comparatively? Yes. Um, the yes, shops were demolished, weren't they, that, um, yeah, well, where this road was? It was Bacon's shop, wasn't that's it? That's right. That and came down. Now it, it shows you, actually this view is probably you couldn't see it years ago with the shops being here. No, no, but once wouldn't. again, the, it's another side of the clock, which is visible from all over in Nuneaton, or was. You you would you would have seen it because the factory towers above there. Yes, you would the actually, shops. wouldn't you? Yes. Mm. No matter you know, no matter what part of the Nuneaton you were in, you could always see that mill. Yes, and what are your uh, Final thoughts about about it going? Very sad, because that's the years I worked there. In fact, um, I I can actually, in my mind, walk all the way round that mill and see the different people that used to work there and the cheery he hellos you used to get as you went from floor to floor. Um, it's it's the passing of an era, really. Um, well, thank you very much, Joan. That, I think that was very interesting. It's a part of Nuneaton's history that's now gone. And perhaps these slides and your talk will sort of keep memories alive. Thank you. <laughs>